Think about the different ways that people can react when they learn the full truth of a situation. Some people can deny that anything negative exists. Some people can recognize their part in the whole system. I was thinking about this as I watched Oprah interview Meghan and Harry, members of the British royal family. I'll admit I don't follow the royals very closely, but a friend told me that I would find the interview eye-opening, so I watched it the next day. A few years ago when the world heard that American Meghan Markle was marrying into the British family, like I said, I usually don't care, but I was excited, and I think it was because she was the first woman of color, a person of color in the royal family, and I thought, wow, that represents our world. She is a princess that I want to follow. In fact, the queen is actually over the Commonwealth, which is 54 different countries that were former British colonies, and they all look a variety of people. They don't all look like the queen. So I like that the royal family was beginning to represent. But it was so heartbreaking to watch this interview because the full truth was being uncovered. You see, Megan has been hounded, has been isolated, has been biased against because of how she looks, because of her race. Her very son, baby Archie, they were questioning what his skin tone would look like. And the hounding from the British tabloids just kept going and going, and no one was speaking up on her behalf. This hurt Harry as well because it's his own family. They talked about how he spoke up because he found out that Megan had suicidal thoughts. She spoke up to human resources because not only is this their family, the royal situation is a job. And they called it the institution, which is everything that makes up the monarchy. Not just family, not just marrying into this great group, but there was protocols and they kept being denied again and again. It's very painful to watch. And it made me think the royal family had an opportunity when the full truth was given to them to say, look how this is hurting people's lives. But how did they respond? They seemed to deny and now the full truth is being shown, how will they react? You see, we all have opportunities to react when the full truth is brought before our eyes. God's people today learned a full truth, and we're gonna read in the scripture in the book of Nehemiah about how they reacted. Here's where we've been in our Now But Not Yet series. The people of God had lived in exile for years under the Babylonians, under the Persians, but the Persians said, you can head back to Jerusalem. And in the book of Ezra, we watched a first wave of people go and rebuild God's temple. They had some delays, they had some roadblocks, but they finally finished it. And at the end of last week, we heard that Ezra was part of the second wave that was coming to Jerusalem. His goal was to bring about a spiritual renewal of God's people. He was a priest and he wanted to teach God's people the law, God's very words that he created, that he spoke to the Jewish people. Let's jump in to Nehemiah chapter eight. We're jumping way in because I want us to look at where Ezra comes up. We're gonna peek in on a communal gathering that was focused on spiritual renewal. And I'd like to say we would know that as a revival, right? This revival had four parts. We're gonna begin with celebration. Nehemiah chapter eight begins. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Ezra opened the book and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, amen, amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The scripture goes on to say that there were Levites there. These were servants of the temple who taught who sang and did some other functions there at the temple, and they helped explain the scripture to all the people gathered there. If you think about it, many who were listening were born in exile, and they might have heard stories passed down to them about their Jewish faith, 
but the literacy rate was not high. Books were not available. So this was the first time they were fully hearing the direct words of God. Nehemiah 8 goes on to say, Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food, sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed the people saying, be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, to celebrate with great joy, because now they understood the words that had been made known to them. Imagine they were weeping because they were hearing the full extent of their faith, of God's words to them as people for the first time. Perhaps you experienced a similar situation when you met Jesus for the first time, when you first read scripture. Just think about that all. And there, all the leaders were like, don't cry. This is a celebration. Let's party. Again, another example, just like we saw in the book of Esther with Purim, that faith was about not just solemn moments, but joyous festivities together. The rest of Nehemiah chapter 8, we read that Ezra keeps reading the word of the law and the people discover, hey, right now it's autumn time and there's a festival that Ezra just read to them that they were supposed to be celebrating right now. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Shelters. In Hebrew, it's called Sukkot. My dear husband Steve likes to call it suck it. If that helps you remember it, great. But it's a time to remember when God's people had escaped slavery from the Egyptians and in the book of Exodus, they were wandering. They didn't have a permanent home, so they were living in temporary shelters. So to celebrate this festival every year, the Jewish people were supposed to take seven days where they put up a temporary little tent, shelter, twigs and branches, and they lived in that for seven days. Ezra read their law to them for seven days and everything was filled with joy. Listen to these words. The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this, and their joy was very great. That was just part one, celebration. The second part of this renewal slash revival was confession. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, feasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. They stood in their places, confessed their sins, and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and worshiping the Lord their God. Ooh, I'm sorry, but that attention span, a quarter of a day reading, six hours, well, I could probably read, but a quarter of the day confessing, six hours of that, I don't know, that sounds tricky. But notice this, they weren't just confessing their own sins, they were confessing the sins of their ancestors. That's kind of a heavy deal here. It seems so different from our culture, right? I mean, isn't it much more prominent for us to hear today? But I didn't fill in the blank. I didn't oppress you, enslave you, abuse you, oppose you, dismiss you, deny you, not believe you. That was someone else. Yet here, God's people could recognize that the past has set the course for their present. They were who they were, for good or for bad, because of the way previous generations had behaved. In fact, they had just been in exile because of their ancestors' sin. You would think that all this anger would be coming out, but it came out in confession to admit what had been done previously. And I get the sentiment behind not wanting to take ownership of something someone else did, I mean, I barely like taking blame when I'm the one acting the fool. But to carry the burden for previous generation sins, that takes courageous humility. In fact, in our American context, that should take an admission from many of us to say that we have benefited in ways when our ancestors had sinned. And because of those same decisions, other people have been held back. If we can't admit that, if we cannot bring that truth to light, then we're never going to be able to fix and make things right moving forward. 
the third aspect of this revival wasn't so much a separate thing, but it kind of was all mixed in, and that's praise. The Levites told the people, stand up, praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. So throughout that confession, throughout that celebration, they were praising God through their words and actions. Listen to these words, blessed be your name, your glorious name. May it be exalted above all blessing and praise. So this revival, we have celebration, we have confession, and now we have commitment. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites and our priests, are fixing their seals to it. The Jewish people had just read through all these parts of the law that they had not realized was there. And then they look back and realize their ancestors had messed it up before. So they wanted to make a commitment to say, we want to do better. We want to put things into practice that we've never done before. And we want to try to get it right this time. So they put it in writing, committed to their God. And they ended with, we will not neglect the house of our God. Here, when the people of God were exposed to the full truth of his law, of his words, of his plans for them, his people. I love that the people of God responded with courageous humility. It's a little bit different from our opening story. And now that the truth of the royal family has been made quite public, because they didn't react when it was told to them privately, let's just keep watch and see how they're reacting now that the world knows. We get the opportunity Every time we learn some newer aspect of God's truth, we get the opportunity to figure out how we're going to respond. Which are we going to look like? Are we going to realize where we are and who we are like God's people? Are we going to mm, stiffen up, kind of ignore things like the royal family? We get the opportunity. And I want us to realize that God brings us things all the time. You can learn truth through his scripture. Maybe someone very wise in your life speaks truth to you. God's spirit moves when you, when you read his word, when you pray, when you spend time in communion and in singing. And we're gaining new depths of God's truth all the time. And sometimes that can be vulnerable to learn and to see where we're lacking. But we can respond like God's people did. Let's look at those four things in our own lives. Celebration, that seems easy, right? Let's eat. Let's hang out together. Hopefully very soon. We've missed that celebrating together. But it's, it's a joyous thing to share your faith with one another. But you know, the other thing we can celebrate is that we know what happened beyond the Old Testament. We know that Jesus came. We know that the people could never be fully saved by following the law because they could never do it perfectly. Jesus came and fulfilled that on our behalf. And he brought his salvation to us. So our celebration has an even deeper joy, I feel. The second thing, confession. As we said before, confession is not super comfortable. We don't talk about it all the time. On an individual level, I know that there are people listening right now. You, Echo Friends out there, you have experienced harm at the hands of people who called themselves Christians. And all you would like them to do, the very least they could do, is to simply confess that they did you wrong. Admit what was their fault, but they haven't. And so the pain keeps burdening you even heavier. In light of that, let's not be the ones doing that to other people. Let's look inside ourselves. Where have we caused harm in someone else's journey? Admitting things is not comfortable, but it opens the door to healing. So we need to look and we need to confess if we have wronged another person. Our confession might not be going and realizing that someone else was harmed, but maybe we need to confess to a trusted friend and say, hey, I am, I'm stuck in some sinful habits right now and I'm, I'm damaging myself and it's not fun. But saying that to another person can allow them to support you, to offer you accountability and strength. Confession, the result of it is beautiful. We're also gonna confess things as a community. It's not just individual. 
I like to look at Echo as a place where we try to look like Jesus and nobody else, where we put God as our priority, first and foremost, where we're a refuge from the pain in the world, from the sin that's out there. But come and be ourselves and whew, take a breath and heal and grow toward being better people. That's how I envision Echo, right? But we have to confess some things. We're not always perfect. We are a church made up of imperfect people. And we're gonna, we're gonna mess up sometimes. We need to quickly own our mistakes and fix them. But number two, we need to speak up about the ways that the church universally as a whole in the past, our ancestors have not acted the way God wanted them to act. There's racism, sexism, abuse, coveting power over serving people, protecting those speaking in the spotlight instead of standing up for those harmed in the shadows, taking love of country, culture, or systems and putting that into the gospel. These are things that are not right and we have to call it out. We have to admit that that happened because people, even though we can think, oh, as a congregation, as Echo Church in our own little group, we don't feel an attachment to that. Well, we haven't done that to people, but other people who claim to be Christians have done that. And we have to know that people walking in our doors and maybe you who are here with us right now feel the pain in the past of people who called themselves God's followers and yet did not live like him. Jesus called it out. He said, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. If we can admit that hypocrisy has happened, still happens, if we can be honest about that as a church, then when people come to us, they can begin healing. They can see that we're being real, we're being honest, and we're saying we're trying to do our part and be different. We need to be that authentic confession right there. This courageous humility will help lead us to this next part, praise. Just like the Jewish people, we're able to say, here's all the stuff you saved us from and we're so thankful, God. When we share the things and we confess, here's all the junk that we're saved from, it makes our praise even more joyful. I think we do praise pretty well, don't you? That celebration and praise. But the last one is commitment. I know some of you may think that's a scary word. Try not to be afraid. Goals, plans, speaking those out loud, that's what, that's what this commitment is all about. It's trying to say, hey, this is what we wanna aim for. Will you join me? Will you join us as leaders of Echo Church? Well, together as a body, can we make these commitments? Let's commit as Echo Church to seek Jesus to redeem us. That's where we start in our faith, recognizing our own need for God. Every one of us in this church family needs Jesus. Nothing else can save us. We as Echo Church commit to help others meet Jesus too. Everyone needs Jesus just like we do. And he offers that love and salvation to everyone. But each of us needs to take a part in sharing this good news. That's why commission is one of our church values. And finally, we as Echo Church commit to grow in Jesus. We don't think we've made it there. We recognize we are works in progress. And that's okay. But we want to strive every day to live more like Jesus. Will you commit to these things with us as a community, as Echo Church? Let's share that with God. Lord, these are our commitments to you. You are gracious you are compassionate. Your love never ends. Thank you for hearing our prayers. We praise you. We confess to you and we come and commit to you. May your glorious name be exalted. Amen. Happy Daylight Saving Day and Happy Pi Day to all those who love math. 3.14. Have a good week.